Today, some of you asking me about refuge, about refuge. And generally, the sentient beings are taking refuge to, to the shelter. Shelter, food, cloth, and uh, among the other sentient beings, humans, we're taking refuge to name, fame, power, money, position, and uh, we need more and more, and uh, never, uh, never enough, never, never satisfied, so never, never happy. And uh, in the religion, in the world there's many religions, and they're also taking refuge, to, to the great one, to the super. And in, in Buddhism, we're taking refuge to whom? Uh, to the healer. Healer is what? Dharma. Dharma is healer of what? Healer of confused. Healer of negative emotion. So it heals us. So that reasons we take refuge to Dharma. We speak about taking refuge. What is the object of refuge and what do we take refuge? In fact, the ultimate <coughs> refuge is present within us as our most fundamental basic nature. And it is these qualities of wisdom, the qualities of love, the qualities of awakened capacity that are present naturally within us, that are in fact the nature, our most basic nature. That is our ultimate refuge. And the reason why this is our ultimate refuge is because nothing else can actually give us refuge. Nothing else can actually protect us. People seek refuge in things like wealth, and food, and power, and fame. Things like this may be able to protect us in some temporary way. But ultimately, truly, they cannot protect us. They cannot serve as our refuge. And so the ultimate refuge is nothing other than our most basic nature. Suchness, this nature that is present within all of us. It has the qualities of wisdom, love, capacity. All of those qualities are present within it. And within this basic nature that we all have, all faults and flaws are completely absent. They have fallen away. And the qualities have unfolded. This is present within the minds of the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, the great noble beings. But it is also present within us as our most basic nature. In our case, however, it's obscured. In our case, it is unmanifest, unclear. And that's because we have not allowed it to unfold. We have not allowed the capacity that is present naturally within us to unfold and to manifest. And how do we do that then? 
how do we allow for our own most basic nature to become manifest and present for us? We do this by beginning with gaining the wisdom that comes from study and reflection, from listening and reflecting on the teachings. And then we have to apply what we have heard and what we have understood directly to our own experience. And when we do that, when we practice in this way, then the faults and the flaws and the stains of our mind, they fall away, they diminish, and the qualities that are naturally present within us are able to further unfold. The Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, these great beings, noble beings, have as the most basic uh, qualities that are present within them. They have love, they have wisdom, they have capacity. And these, within them, these qualities have unfolded perfectly and are perfectly manifest. They um, are, in fact, those who possess, who are endowed with the most excellent qualities of body, speech, and mind, of awakened body, speech, and mind. And in fact, within your own, within our own body, speech, and mind, we also have those same qualities. It's simply that they are not yet manifest. They have not yet unfolded. They are not yet uh, accessible to us in that way. And we speak then about the Buddha nature, the Buddha nature that is present within all of us, and yet it is present in a way that is not apparent to us at all times. It's unmanifest uh, for us. And the best way then for us to make that manifest, for us to allow that Buddha nature which is present within us to become apparent is to practice what we call gathering the accumulations and purifying our obscurations. And one of the methods by which we can do this is engaging in the practice of, for example, the six paramitas, the six perfections. We have the excellent opportunity of having attained a precious human body. We have the excellent fortune of having met a spiritual teacher, a genuine spiritual teacher. And from that teacher, we receive the teachings of the Dharma, and then we need to put those into practice. When we put the Dharma teachings into practice, then we are able to allow the qualities that are manifest in noble beings to unfold within our own experience. Those excellent qualities that are hidden or covered or obscured within us, it is through practicing that these qualities may become manifest and reach their full potential. So the cause for all of this, the cause is the Buddha nature. And that's something that we all have, this cause, of the, which is the Buddha nature. The support then for practicing is a precious human body, endowed with the freedoms and advantages. And then on top of that, we rely upon the condition, the excellent condition, which is a spiritual teacher, a genuine spiritual teacher. And there are different kinds of spiritual teachers. There are the spiritual teacher, there's a way of following a spiritual teacher and the qualifications of a spiritual teacher that pertain to the general vehicle of the Buddhist teachings. And then there is a spiritual teacher who is uh, a teacher according to the tradition of the Mahayana, the great vehicle. And then we can also speak about a spiritual teacher in the context of the teachings of secret mantra. But in general, it's absolutely essential that in any of these cases, the teacher, him or herself, is a genuine teacher. We speak about the importance of a genuine teacher, a genuine student, and the genuine teachings, the genuine dharma. This is essential. That's actually the case in any context, a worldly context or a dharmic context. We always want something that's genuine, right? The authentic thing, the real thing. That's what we need, and it's very important. 
So here, um, when we speak about the context of just uh, a, a spiritual teacher in the general vehicle of the teachings, then what kind of teacher is that? And we need to encounter such a teacher, and how is it that we go about following a spiritual teacher? What is it that the teacher needs to have? In the context of the great vehicle, in the context of the secret mantra, there are also different qualifications that we speak of that a teacher needs to have in order to be considered a genuine spiritual teacher. But to come back to the original question that was posed earlier this morning to me, what does taking refuge mean? And why do we actually take refuge? Why do we take refuge? It's because we recognize that our own body, speech, and mind are right now functioning in ways that are faulty, that we have faults and flaws present within our body, our speech, and our mind. And we want to separate from, to get rid of, to overcome those faults and flaws. And we want to allow the qualities the perfectly pure aspects of body, speech, and mind that have been present within us from the very beginning. They have always been there, but we want to allow those to unfold. So that's why we take refuge. And the method for overcoming these faults and flaws that are present currently within us and for allowing these positive qualities this purity that has been within us from the very beginning, the way of allowing that to unfold, the method for doing that is practicing the Dharma. And when we practice the Dharma, we begin by studying. And we begin, then we move on to reflecting, reflecting upon the Dharma teachings. Ultimately, of course, the point of Dharma practice is to encounter ourselves the state of perfect awakening of Buddhahood. That's why we practice the Dharma. And the path by means of which we do this is the Dharma itself. And our companions as we traverse this path are our spiritual teachers. So we speak about the objects of refuge, the three jewels, the precious objects of refuge, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And as it has been said, The Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha are the refuge for those who seek liberation, those who wish to be liberated. For us, the refuge objects are the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. This is in the context of the general teachings of the Buddha. In the context of the teachings of secret mantra, when we speak about this genuine, ultimate object of refuge, here we speak about the most basic, most fundamental nature of our own minds. That is the ultimate object of refuge in the context of secret mantra. That is the Buddha nature which is present within all of us. And in the context of secret mantra, in order to have the opportunity to connect with that, in order to be able to recognize that most basic nature, We rely upon the instructions of a qualified teacher, a qualified guru. And so we speak about recognizing the nature of our own mind. This is, in fact, the ultimate refuge from the perspective of secret mantra. So recognizing the nature of your own mind is, in fact, the ultimate refuge. Sustaining um, mindfulness without distraction is the ultimate protection. The guru is not outside of you. The guru is the nature of your own mind. And so when we talk about the guru, there are many different ways of talking about the guru. Um, It is said that recognizing the nature of your own mind is the ultimate guru yoga actually. And so we can speak about the guru, which is the guru, the symbolic guru of appearances around us. That is also a teacher. That is also a guru for us. And then we speak about the guru who is an individual, a person. Because as humans, we connect very well with other humans. So this is another type of guru, the guru who is an individual, a person, a lineage holder.